What's up guys, Alexander here, Date Psychology. So the big question, who is more misogynistic? The successful Chad who runs through a bunch of women or the unsuccessful man? The incel, right? Or if not that, men who are less successful, right? The uh, man who is less successful with women. There's some debate on this. I see this come up often where people go back and forth and they say, oh no, actually the most misogynistic men are the men who have the lowest success with women. Oh no, it's the men who have the most success with women. I'm going to share a bunch of research with you, kind of look and see what it shows. What is the big picture here with that? So going forward, the first paper here, gender differences and automatic in-group bias. Why do women like women more than men like men? And this is a paper on essentially in-group bias by sex, right? That women show a stronger preference for women than men show for men. And men also have a bias in favor of women. You know, this has been discussed as the women are wonderful effect. This paper goes over a lot of different forms of bias, but one of these explanations for positive attitudes toward women in this paper is sex, right? The idea that, okay, men may have more positive attitudes towards women because they receive sex from women. Uh, describing here from the paper, I'll read what it says. Compared with women, men report greater liking for and interest for sex. Uh, papers by Baumeister and others. Baumeister, famous psychologist. If men associate sex with women, for example, through heterosexual encounters, then the more they like sex, the more they should like women. So... Let's go on and see kind of what's going on. Here's kind of the methodology of this. Participants responded to two items to assess their sexual experience. I consider myself sexually experienced and I have never had a sexual partner. So highly sexually experienced men and people who have not had any sex. Uh, Likert scale here, one to five. And then this gender attitude index, which is essentially hostility toward women. Is it positive or negative? These uh, attitudes toward women. Let's go on to the next slide and see. For both men and women, the more sexual encounters they had, the more they reported a preference for the opposite sex, irrespective of their liking for sex. This is on the explicit attitudes. This study used implicit attitudes as well. And you may or may not know, but implicit association tests, they're not very good. We don't know what they measure. We don't actually know if it measures what we think of in bias and you know, there's a lot of use in this test as far in diversity and in racial bias and all of that. But these tests, we don't know that they actually predict actual bias in practice, but whatever. We're not looking at the implicit results here. We're looking at the explicit results, actual attitudes. So that's what we see here. The more sexual encounters, the more they were liked the opposite sex. Explanation for this. A plausible interpretation is that men who like sex and have their sexual needs fulfilled by women tend to automatically favor women. Whereas men who want but are deprived of sex may implicitly resent women. Keep this in mind because we're going to look at a more recent paper by Selmer and colleagues that found the opposite of this. But keep that in mind, this idea. Men who want but who are deprived of sex may resent women. Let's go forward. Here's another paper. It's mentioned in the previous paper. And this is a quotation from the previous paper, but the title is what it is citing here if you want to look that up. Uh, they said, this interpretation coheres with Glick and Fisk's argument that men may express benevolence toward women because they depend on them for sexual relations. If women are not forthcoming, their dyadic power over men may backfire, resulting in implicit sexism. So this is using the ambivalent sexism inventory. Benevolent sexism is what they're talking about here. Benevolence toward women. Benevolent sexism is what these researchers, who are feminists, this is a feminist paradigm, said was essentially sexist attitudes, but that are positive. For example, women should be first on the lifeboat is an example from the inventory. Hostile sexism, on the other hand, are negative attitudes toward women that are hostile, as you would expect. Like women are ruining the world for me, that kind of a thing. So men who are more successful with women may develop these benevolent attitudes. Men who are less successful with women may develop these hostile attitudes. And we'll look at a little bit more with hostile sexism as we go through some more results in this. Let's go on to the next slide. This is a paper from 2020, Contugan, titled is, To What Extent Are Incels Misogynistic and Violent Attitudes Toward Women Driven by Their Unsatisfied Mating Needs and Entitlement to Sex? So the results of this, 
Ran a correlation, Pearson correlation, significant and positive correlations between entitlement and frustrated mating needs. So we're looking at entitlement to sex, and we're also looking at frustrating mated needs. Men that want to mate, but who can't. So these are correlated, okay? We see a correlation, 0.48, so not a bad sized correlation in psychology, right? The average is about 0.2 to 0.3 across psychology. Entitlement and hostility towards women. So men who feel more entitled or more hostile, okay? So that doesn't necessarily tell us anything about you know, if men who are more or less successful are going to be more hostile toward women. But the other item does at a correlation of 0.37, frustrated mating needs. So the men who are not getting their mated needs met, right? They're not hooking up. They're not forming relationships. You know, they're not seeking and finding mates. They express more hostility toward women. Correlation of 0.37. So the model summary with entitlement and frustrating mating needs regressed on hostility toward women was also significant at uh, squared of uh, 0.29, so explains a decent chunk of the variance there. Where does hostility toward women come from? Part of the picture is frustrated mating. That's kind of what we see here. Whoops, let's go on now to the next one. Here's uh, Morsenkoff, similar kind of paper, but they didn't find a significant relationship. The title of this is Novel Explanations for Misogynistic Attitudes in Society. What are they looking at here? Well, they're looking at uh, Frustrated mating needs again, no relationship, but in this paper, probably, you know, the reason they didn't detect a relationship is because they had an underpowered sample. They had three individuals who would have identified as incels in this sample. And if you don't have enough statistical power, meaning the size of your sample, then you won't be able to detect an effect, even if it's real. So something to consider with this. But here we see a paper that found no relationship. But again, no relationship also doesn't mean the opposite, right? It doesn't mean that, you know, more successful women or excuse me, more successful men are going to be more hostile toward women. Let's go on to the next one. Here's one by Grunau in 2020. Involuntary celibacy, personality traits among misogynistic online communities. And what do we see here in this measure of misogyny that they used? The non-incel sample scored lower than the incel sample, uh, substantially lower, right? They didn't report here a uh, effect size, which they probably should have, but, you know, if you go from point, or 2.56 to 4.15, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty big difference on something like this. Next slide, let's see here, looking at this a little bit further. This is individuals, because they asked, they used the binary in this, they asked individuals, are you an incel, are you not an incel? And then they also used a measure of kind of in-group identification called the in-group ties scale, which has questions like the one on the slide, right? I have a lot in common with incels. And then you can categorize people as, okay, these are low incels, and it goes up, you know, one to five or one to seven. These are high incels. And what do we see? Again, individuals that scored lower on this scale, that had less identification with incels, also scored lower in misogyny. Let's go on now to the next slide. This is also from the same paper. We see incel identification, you know, correlated with misogyny here, 0.42, and also correlated with uh, level of incel them, excuse me, level of incel them should be 0.42, incel identification 0.4, using this hostility toward women scale. And what is that? It has questions on it like, generally it is safer not to trust women. So we kind of see, you know, higher hostility here associated with incel them in that case, kind of not the opposite of incel them as you might expect. But let's go forward and continue looking at these papers. Here's one called personal relative deprivation increases men's, but not women's hostile sexism, the mediating role of self-control. So from the title alone, you already kind of know what it is getting at, right? Being deprived of something increases men's hostile sexism, in this case, being deprived of sex. Now, these are quotations from a SciPost article from the author of the paper. So I took those uh, and I want to read to you what he said here. We wanted to examine men's perspective and in particular by understanding men's perception of their experience and environment and see if this can also potentially promote gender equality. Therefore, we focused on personal relative deprivation of men, a prevalent experience in men's lives, such as not having a romantic partner, suffering from repeated rejections by others, and experiencing inferiority in financial status. We showed that personal relative deprivation can be predictive of and result in men's hostile sexism toward women. So, that there in yellow is the title of this article in SitePost. You can check it out and you can click the link there and you can 
also go and you know read the paper if you would like to. Let's go on to the next one. This is a result of my own research here. I developed a scale. I called it the red black pill scale, but it's kind of a measure of different beliefs and attitudes in the manosphere. And I ran, you know, the ambivalent sexism inventory. What do we see here? A really strong correlation. You don't see correlations this size in psychology that often. You know, Spearman's row of 0.73. So there's a very, very robust link between individuals who hold manosphere beliefs, red black pill beliefs, and men who don't. And some examples from that scale are things like, I think that 20% of men are having sex with 80% of the women, those kinds of things. So they're not necessarily hostile beliefs, but they do predict hostile sexism. The more immersed people seem to be in this kind of manosphere ideology, yeah, the more hostile sexism they, they tend to express. Let's go forward again. This one is, uh, unwanted celibacy is associated with misogynistic attitudes, even after controlling for personality. Again, we kind of see in the title here uh, what it's getting at, right? It just says it straight out. Unwanted celibacy associated with misogynistic attitudes. Again, this is one that used a binary measure, yes and no. And also, they indicated their degree of unwanted celibacy across 12 items. So, let's go forward and see what this shows here. We have this hostility toward women measure. We have sexual objectification, rape myths, and rape proclivity, the willingness to actually commit you know, a rape. And what do we see here? Well, hostility toward women correlated with unwanted celibacy at 0.38, sexual objectification at 0.21, rape myth endorsement at 0.29, but no relationship with proclivity, okay? So it's probably not the case, you know, that a lot of incels are willing to actually go out there and commit a rape. And I think, you know, that's something we actually haven't even seen in the news or stuff. It just doesn't seem to be happening that much. They don't seem to be a community that is especially acting on uh, these attitudes, but they do hold these attitudes. They are more hostile towards women. Let's go forward here. Another paper, recent. Changes in positive affect due to popularity in an experimental dating context influence some of men's, but not women's, socio-political attitudes. Now, in this paper, they put individuals in a dating app experiment. So we see a causal effect here. And we see when people receive more rejections, what happens? I'll read it here. Romantic rejection can significantly increase both men and women's hostile attitudes and aggressive behaviors toward the opposite sex. Local ecologies characterized by heightened male intersexual competition for mates such as areas with high income equality, male bias sex ratios, and with cultural practices like high bride prices can distort mating markets and lead on to radicalization and violence. In short, romance, mating, and reproduction can impact politics. So that's what we see here in this paper as well, that men who are rejected more develop more hostile attitudes towards women. Let's go on to the next one here. This is the paper that I mentioned at the beginning. And the reason I made this video, the reason I wanted to go over this paper is because I've seen a lot of people uh, repeating it, you know, sharing it around and saying, oh yeah, it's the most successful men who are actually the most misogynistic. It is the chads with their very misogynistic attitudes and not the men who are excluded from mating. So what do they say in this paper in the discussion? Contrary to this narrative, we find that the extreme misogynists in our sample are not the young men who report having no sexual activity despite intentions and desires but rather the young men who report a high degree of sexual activity and experience while reporting relatively low levels of sociosexual intentions. So men who have had a lot of sex basically and who are low in sociosexuality in this paper had more misogynistic attitudes. And additionally what they say, furthermore, the incels opposite, the chads, the archetypal alpha males who is socially dominant and successful in terms of finding romantic and sexual partners appears to hold the most extreme misogynistic views in our sample. Okay, well, let's go and see this paper. Let's have a look and see kind of what they've done here. You know, they ran the sociosexuality inventory, as mentioned, and you have different facets of this, right? You have SOI have, which is people who have high sexual experience, more sexual partners, and then SOI want, which is people who have a high sexual desire. They want to have more sexual partners. They ran this scale. They called it the extreme misogyny scale, and they based it on statements from the manifesto of Elliot Rogers. So this is kind of, you know, kind of classic, typical beliefs that you might find within that community. And they also ran social dominance orientation, dark triad measure, and a need from, for control measure. These are other 
personality measures. What did they find here? They, they, they didn't report this in coefficients, they reported it in better regressions, but the correlation between uh, the have on the sociosexuality inventory, men with more partners, more sexual experience, it was positive, significant, but I don't think that's very large, right? A beta coefficient of 0.113. SOI want and the EMS, okay, 0.235. Psychopathy on the dark triad, much higher, right? 0.7. So that's something that we know that, you know, individuals who score high in the dark triad, they do tend to have more uh, hostile attitudes, right? They endorse more hostile sexes and that sort of thing. Machiavellianism, 0.199, a little bit lower. Narcissism was not significant, which is interesting because research on the dark triad that indicates, you know, why is this attractive to women? If you look at the individual faucets, it's usually narcissism that's associated with attractiveness to women. And why is that? Perhaps narcissists take care of their appearance more. Perhaps they care more about putting on a presentation or a show that is attractive. But we're kind of seeing something here that doesn't entirely line up. But, but we do expect, you know, the dark triad to be associated with uh, uh, more hostile beliefs toward women. Let's go forward. This kind of shows the interaction, right? Individuals who were low in having, right? Not much sex, but high in wanting, they showed low misogyny. And this is the individuals that they called the incels in this paper. And that does raise a question. You know, if you don't have much sexual experience, but you want it, are you an incel? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. They're not people who call themselves that. But on the other hand, high SY have here and low SY want, so people who have had a lot of sex, I should say men who have had a lot of sex, but who don't want to have a lot of sex, they have higher misogyny. So that raises another question. Is that what a Chad is, as they say in this paper? Is a Chad someone who has a lot of sex but doesn't want to have a lot of sex, who has a lot of sexual partners? You know, this could just as easily describe someone who wants a relationship but has had a handful of failed relationships, right? I think, you know, if you think about what a Chad is, you probably think about physical appearance. You probably think about success with women as well. Well, let's go on to the next slide. These are kind of the questions that we need to ask, right? Are incels men who simply want sex a lot, but who don't get sex? And are chads men who have a high level of sexual experience, but who don't want sex? Quotation from this paper. It might be important when combating extreme misogyny linked to the acceptance of violence to take a closer look at the chads to stay in the incel terminology. Sociosexual, sociosexually successful men who display high degrees of SDO and dark personality traits. That raises another question because we do see in these communities that the chads are described as being high in the dark triad, sometimes being very antisocial. But we should ask, is that what defines a chad? Or is it their physical appearance? Is it their success with women? These are all different things, and they're actually not that closely related. So let's go forward. Uh, what did we see as well in this paper? Actual incels, right? They said that they operationalized 74 incels. So these are men that had no sex at all. And what did they say? No significant association with being an incel and extreme misogyny. So, you know, they didn't find that they were different from the rest of the population, which might be something else to consider that, you know, men who had sexual experience were not more misogynistic in this or did not endorse more of the items on this extreme misogyny scale that they used. Let's go on to the next one. So, when I saw this, you know, if we've looked at the previous papers, you know, what kind of stands out? We already kind of have a series of papers and results that says men who are deprived of sex develop hostile attitudes toward women. We have kind of a theoretical basis for understanding why that is, which is important in psychology. You know, if you have a result, you need to be able to explain why that result emerges as well. You know, if you're just finding a relationship between things, sometimes that's okay. Maybe you don't have an explanation, but you know, we kind of see a consistent line of research that says, you know, men who are deprived of sex, but who want it, are developing more hostile attitudes toward women because of it. You know, we see this in certain communities as well. And given that, when this, you know, I saw this paper, everyone's posting it and sharing it, I thought, okay, does this replicate? Is this something, you know, that, that I could find as well, using the same scale they used, the extreme misogyny scale? And... If so, you know, did they really operationalize what a chad is very well? So I asked two questions, kind of following methodology similar to the previous papers. I would call myself an incel, yes, no, so just binary, and then I have been without sex for more than two years and it's not by choice, right? So we have incel identification, people who say, I'm an incel, and then we have other people who say, you know, 
I've been without sex, and I'd like to be having sex. So we're kind of covering the same ground here. And then I made another scale, I called this the Chad scale, and I thought, this is probably a series of items that's more closely representative of what people think of when they are talking about a Chad within these communities, right? Because we have two things on this. Uh, men who are successful with women and men who have certain physical traits that make them physically attractive, the black pill, right? So here are the items on that. I'm tall enough that I stand out from other men. I do better than most men on dating apps, right? So the dating app belief. Uh, physically, I'm more muscular, right? So physique, more facially attractive than other men, lower body fat percentage, uh, attractive chin and jawline, attractive eyes, full head of hair, so not bald. Uh, women approach me for dates more often than they do other men. So now we're looking at success with women. When I flirt with women, it usually goes well for me. Uh, I've been more success sexually successful than other men as well. Similar item to what we've seen in the previous papers. Even as a teenager and young adult, I was good with women. So this is an item, sometimes you see in these, you know, that if, if you don't have kind of that teenage love experience, if you weren't good with women as a teenager or something like that, you're never going to be. So there's another belief there. Uh, I regularly comment compliments from women. Uh, throughout my adult life, I have not gone long periods of time without a sexual or romantic partner. And I often recognize benefits in my life from being attractive outside of dating contexts, such as at work. So we're looking at these physical things, how do men perceive themselves, and their sexual experience. And what do we see here looking at this? When I compared men who were not incels, who said, I'm not an incel, with the ones that said, yeah, I identify as an incel, they scored much lower on this scale used in the Selmer paper. I mean, that's a big effect size, 1.23. You don't see that that much in psychology, right? Uh, and the same for men who said, I have not had sex in the past two years, but I would like to. They also scored higher on this extreme misogyny scale than the population who you know, was sexually active. Here's the correlation with the scale that I made and the extreme misogyny scale, negative 0.29. So, you know, a moderate sized correlation for psychology. What do we see here, right? That the lower individuals scored on this Chad scale, the higher they scored on the extreme misogyny scale, the individuals who were the least misogynistic also scored the highest on the Chad scale. They had the highest self-perceived mate value. And that's something we know from past research as well, <clears throat> that self-perceived mate value, thinking I do good with women, you know, I attract women and all of that, you know, it's associated with less hostile attitudes. Let's go forward and look. I took the top 10% of men on the Chad scale, right? And I just dichotomized this here. I took them out and I made them a group. I'm going to call these the Giga Chads, right? Because they're the highest scorers. They're the top 10% of the men. And what do we see? How do they compare to the incels as well? Again, another really big effect size. They scored much lower in extreme misogyny than the incels did. So... Given these results, what can we say about the Selmer paper? It kind of stands out, you know, with something different from what is shown in a lot of the past research. And, you know, when I kind of did this my way, this conceptual replication of it, I got a very different result. And I got a result with much larger effect sizes. Now, there's a recent paper, you know, if you've heard about the replication crisis and all of that, a lot of things don't replicate. Recent paper said, what things are associated with what does replicate? One of those, a good predictor of that, is the size of the effect. If you have a large effect size, then there's a better chance that that will replicate, that it's real, right? When you see big differences, they come out more easily. They're more obvious. So kind of confident in this result. But let's go on now to the final slide. Final thoughts. What can we learn from this? I want to ask you guys, leave a comment. What is your impression across all of this research? What is the big picture, right? Because... People do with papers, you know, they find a paper that kind of confirms their beliefs, their biases or something like that. And then they say, ah, what about this? It's right. I believe it. Well, why do you believe it? From the methodology, because the results are strong, large effect size, none of that, just because it's what you want to believe, basically. And across all of research, you know, you will get papers that say one thing and you will get papers that say another. How do you know what to believe? Which papers to believe? You can't just look at one paper. You have to look at all of the research, right? You know, ideally a meta-analysis or something like that is kind of a formal way of doing it. But just being really familiar with the research also helps, you know. But look at multiple papers and what they say. You can't just pick one out. And if you're not familiar with the research, you might not know, right? You might not know, like, this is different. This is not what all the rest of the research says. 
So something to consider there, you know, if you reflect upon all of the research, what do you think the relationship is with sexual success and misogyny? Are men who are more successful more misogynist? Is that what the research shows? I don't think so. But, you know, as always, my mind could be changed on that. I'm not super dogmatic about it, but I think that's kind of where it stands at the moment. Another question. I made this Chad scale. What do you guys think it measures? You know, I think at the very least it measures some kind of self-perceived mate value, but leave a comment. Do you think, you know, this is a good uh, index or description of what a Chad is? Someone with all the best physical traits who, you know, is physically attractive and someone who's very successful with women as well. Something else to consider. I mentioned this at the beginning. What is the theory behind the result? Why do we see what we do? Why would lower sexual success be associated with negative attitudes toward women? Or if you believe the opposite, why would higher sexual success be associated with negative attitudes toward women? We seem to have a good explanation for why lower sexual success would be uh, from different points of view, right? You know, the idea that it uh, takes control away from the individual, that it doesn't confirm the individual, it doesn't validate them. It's something that they want, but that they're deprived of having. I don't really see a good explanation for why the opposite would be true. But if you do, leave a comment. Let's see. And something to consider across all of these papers, you know, these aren't just using the same measurements for misogyny, hostility toward women, negative attitudes. These are a lot of different measures, you know, some ask like, are you an incel? Some, you know, have you not had sex in the last two years? Whatever the case may be. So across all of these different measurements, we still see kind of the same result, don't we? You know, that men who are lower in successful success are the ones that tend to express uh, more hostile attitudes or whatever the case may be. Anyway, that is all for this. Hope you guys liked the video. Like, subscribe, hit the bell. I will make another for you very soon.